So, um, if it, most of you don't know, I'm Casey. I'm with Home Time Realty. I've been an agent for about a year and a half. Uh, actually, no, coming up on two years, I take that. Um, and I just wanted to sit down and talk to you about how to write a great offer in this environment. Um, because like we talked about a few minutes ago, um, it is a really, really hard and there's lots of competition that's going on right now. So really the first thing that you've got to do to write a great offer is once your client walks out of that house and is like, this is the one I want, you're on the phone with that other agent asking a ton of questions. So I call the other agent, I ask if they have any other offers, I ask if they're holding all offers, if I don't see it in MLS, um, I ask what their client is looking for, are they looking for, you know, a quick close, are they looking for just cash or um, money wise, are they looking for us to, you know, waive some inspections, like what is important to their client? Because that'll help me when then talking to my clients to say, hey, this is what the buyers are looking for. Can we make that happen? And if we can't, like we can't, but we're going to do our best to try to appease the, the sellers because that means the sellers are going to, you know, pick our offer because we're going to be playing in their ball field. Um, like I have one that went under contract. The sellers were like, hey, I need a long close date or we need a rent back. So we did a rent back for two months. We were 10 grand under the other one, but we got picked because we did that rent back for two months so that they had the time to go find a home and they weren't pressed to, you know, rush into something. So after you get off the phone with that agent and you've got all the information you can pull out of that agent, I will tell you a good agent isn't going to give you much because a good agent wants you to just write the highest and best that you've got. Um, what I was going to ask gonna... you, not to yeah. interrupt, but do you ever find that they don't really disclose a lot of information? Yes, there are some agents that don't and there's some agents that do. I know uh, one of the agents that works for Hometown, he gets permission to um, be able to share the highest price that they have so far. And so then he, he gets permission from his sellers. He shares that to the buyer's agents like me who call. And then the buyer's agents are able to go from there. Like, do we go above it? Do we need it? Like, what do we do from there? So it's, you need to get permission as a listing agent to share all of those things. Uh, with your buyer's agents that call in, but yes, Andrea, I find sometimes they are so tight lipped and they're like, just write us a clean offer. And like, that's literally all I get. But I tried. The other reason you're calling is you're trying to build that rapport. So you're trying to get to know this agent, make sure this agent knows like this is going to be a smooth transaction. I'm easy to work with. I know what I'm talking about. Like you're trying to build that rapport with that agent because ultimately that agent is also going to have some, you know, say and sway over the sellers. And if it comes down to you and another one and the agent knows you and knows what you're doing and what you're about, like you're going to probably be the one picked. So you you're might, trying to build, huh? You might be going over this later, but uh -huh. if they don't provide you a lot of information, what have you found is the best avenue? Is it a higher price? Is it waiving the inspection? What have you found is, has been most successful? So there's a combo of that. And I actually will be going over that later. So I'll get to that in a little bit. So after you finish talking to that agent, building that rapport, getting all the information that you can get, then you're going to call your buyers. I usually tell my buyers when we leave the house, I'm like, start thinking about the highest price that you would be willing to pay and comfortable with. So that they can throw out a number to me and then I can go, it's probably not going to appraise, let's not go that high. Or I can go, yeah, let's do that, no problem. The way I get them to think about it is they'll be like, well, what about like 270? You know, maybe the house is listed for 265. And I'm like, okay, so if somebody came and paid 271, would you be super mad that you lost it? And that's how I get them thinking of where their threshold is. So they're thinking, I'm calling the agent, now we're coming back together to talk, and I'm talking to them with, this is all the information I found out from the agent, this is where you're comfortable, now let's come together and chat about what we're going to do. Um, so say the agent you know, tells me, oh, we really want some home inspection waivers, or we want some home inspection like done informational purposes only. Well then, I as an agent have already walked through that house, and I have seen you know, do I see cracks in the walls? Do I see, you know, cracks in the foundation? Did it have a basement that I was able to go look at all the beams and do the beams look like they're falling apart? Like, 
when I'm walking through the house, I'm looking at all the structural piece to go, hey, if they're asking that, yeah, we could probably do that or no, that's not a good idea. Like we can't do that at all. You know, and with these first time home buyers, sometimes they're like, I don't even wanna do that at all. And that's fine. Cause that's not what makes your buyer comfortable. Ultimately you work for your buyer. Whatever makes them comfortable is what you're gonna do, whether that's gonna win you that, that contract or not. Um, and so I'll come back to them and be like, okay, this is what they're looking for. Are you comfortable with these things? And they'll tell me yes or no. Say we get to inspection and they want that inspection waiver and they're like, no, I'm not comfortable. I'll be like, okay, we could do, you know, $2,000. We could do any item over, you know, under a hundred. We could do, like, we could do some other things to make them feel comfortable without, you know, completely waiving home inspection. Does that make sense? So, and then I'll say, okay, let's talk price. I am a huge advocate and have won um, many, many um, contracts with escalation clauses. So I will start my buyers at like five to 10,000 over if that's what they want to do, or I will start my buyers at a couple thousand, whatever is comfortable for them. And then I will write an escalation clause up to what they're comfortable with, but not just what they're comfortable with, what I think would also do would appraise. Because I don't want to be the agent that writes this astronomical, crazy, you know, the house is listed at 225 and I'm right at $300,000 contract. That would be really stupid. It's not going to appraise up there, you know? And I'm not here to write a contract that's not going to appraise because the sellers might accept it. And then we're going to have to talk about bringing it down later anyways. Does that all make sense? Yes. So I'm going to help them. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, have you ever been in a situation where it doesn't appraise and mm -hmm. your clients did overpay and then they like end up yep. having to pay less than they initially would have? Like, yep. does I have I had two of those in the past three months. So I've been on the seller side where he was like, I want it 200,000. I kept telling him it's not going to appraise. It'll appraise at 195. Appraisal came back 195. We literally just lowered the price because we were on the sell side. I'm like, she's either going to walk away or you're going to lower the price. What do you want to do? Right. And so he just signed the paper. We went on. I have been on the buyer side where my buyers paid 10 grand over to get it. Um, it appraised 10, it appraised at value of what the house was listed for. The seller came back to them and said, Hey, we know you paid 10 grand over. If you pick up five, we'll pick up five and we'll call it a day. And my, my buyers were like, yeah, we're making like three times as much on our house than we thought we were making. We will pick up $5,000. Cool. And so they brought an extra, extra um, chunk to the table. I will never waive appraisal when I'm writing a contract. Uh, the reason for that is I tell all my buyers, look, gosh forbid you get in this property and a year later you have to sell. Maybe, you know, your world falls apart. You get in a promotion to a totally different city, whatever it may be. If we go 10,000 over, you pay, you know, you waive the appraisal. So now you have to pay that extra 10 grand out of your pocket. Now you're asking me to sell it a year later. You're coming to the table with more money because between fees and um, closing costs and the market not, you know, making up for that 10 grand, like they're not going to be able to make all of the money that they made, that they bought it for. So I would never waive appraisal because I want to protect my buyers. Gosh forbid something happens a year down the road. Because I don't want that call where we've got to sell and I'm going, oh great, like you overpaid and now I got to sell your house and try to get you all your money back. Like that's not the feeling I want as an agent uh, when they ask me to sell it. So if they are comfortable with waiving like a thousand or 2000, like I will give them the exact same spiel and say, hey, if this happens, this is what might happen. And if they're still like, yeah, we'll pick up 2000, then I will write it. But I will never waive it completely, ever. I'm not gonna put my buyer in that situation. And I will tell you, I have lost deals by not doing that. And I'm fine with that. And my buyers are fine with that, actually, when I tell them. So, does that help, Ariel? Yeah, and I actually, I have another question as well, but I don't sure. want to derail where this is going. So I was going to say, if you want to come back to me, I'm fine waiting. Yep, I can do that. Okay. So um, once I get, we get, like we were talking about escalation clause, I get back with my buyers, I will write the um, contract. 
and then I will write an escalation clause. Is there anybody who doesn't know what an escalation clause is? You all nod your head if yes. you do, that'd be great. Perfect, okay. So I will write an escalation clause. I will write it for a thousand dollar increment. I used to write them for a hundred, um, got laughed at at one, you know, one of the, um, the offers I put in and they're like, hey Casey, if you wrote it for a thousand, you would have got it, learned my lesson, write the escalation clause for about a thousand dollars. So if, you know, they're comfortable paying, I just had one, they were comfortable. We put it in at two, um, 270 houses on the market for 265, we wrote the escalation clause up to 290. And so if somebody came in at 275, they would pay 276 is basically what would happen um, instead of 275, 100, which yeah, is not a really big incentive for the you know sellers to pick ours over the other one. Um, but I will write that to protect them. So I don't go in guns blazing, here's the very top. I still get them a great deal without putting my highest and best on there. Not all agents like it when you write those, um, but you know they're legally allowed. They're great places to protect your buyers within a range versus just here's the guns blazing, here's everything we got. So, with the escalation clause, after we talk about that, we will talk about home inspection. Like, do we want to waive some? Do we not want to waive some? We will talk about home warranty. Do we want to ask for one or not? I know it's like 500 bucks, but it has made a difference in some of the, some of the things that I have written and some of the offers I've written. Like the home warranty has been the, the deciding factor where I'm like, hey guys, if you really want it, you got to pay for it, you know, calling my buyers. And they're like, yeah, we can take on another 500 bucks, not a problem. But that's a big question to ask when you're talking to a seller is like, hey, if their bottom line is I want money, 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 like if we ask for the home warranty, is that going to be an issue? So that's another thing that you can ask to help build rapport for you. Um, in this market, I rare, especially when I'm going up against other um, offers, I rarely ask for closing costs. Um, I know a lot of first-time home buyers need it, so you have to ask for some. My take on it is that I will, instead of um, during home inspection, I don't ask for fixes usually. I usually ask for closing costs there for my buyers to go ahead and fix it on their own. Um, it's just a personal preference of mine. If it's something big, foundation, roof, um, plumbing, leak, you know, those types of things, like the big major things that you definitely want fixed because you want them in a great house, uh, we will ask for those to be fixed, but the little things, you know, door handle is loose, the lock doesn't exactly line up, you got to push the door in to lock it a little bit, you know, the smaller things that they can get fixed down the road, or they can live with, we usually ask for money, and that's where I pick up my closing costs. Um, be careful with that, and make sure your clients are okay with that, and make sure your clients, you have talked your clients through that. I have clients that are like, absolutely not, we can't do that, we want it fixed, that's fine, we'll ask for fixes. But I have that discussion up front before we write the offer so I know what I'm dealing with. Because if they need all these things, you know, if they need all fixes, they're not comfortable with taking closing costs then, then I'm going to say, okay, hey, we'll ask for two or three grand of closing costs, but we'll up our price a little bit. We'll up our escalation clause a little bit. Like we'll play with the numbers to make it work. But very, very few times do anything that I ask for closing costs get accepted. It's the market we're in. So, Andrea, you asked before, what am I finding if you don't get any information? What am I finding works? The things I'm finding work are escalation clause and playing with inspection. Because the reason inspection works so well is once you get through, so you've got a round of negotiations in the beginning to agree on a price. And then if you do inspection, you have a whole round of negotiations with the inspection. Well, if you tell the seller, hey, we're either going to do it for informational purpose only, which again, it's got to be the right house, or we're going to waive like anything under a hundred bucks. So we're, you know, we're going to waive 2000 of all the fines that we find, or you, you give them something that you're going to waive a little bit of inspections. Like that's less of a negotiation they know they have to do. And so there's only really one big negotiation they're doing with you. You put that in the initial offer or do you have to wait until the inspection to... No, you put that. it in the initial offer. 
Okay. Like even if you're going to say that you won't ask for anything above $200. Mm -hmm. You'll write it in that additional comment. So I think it's like paragraph 23, 24, okay. somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but if I waive it, I'm writing like inspection for informational purposes only. Buyer still has the right to um, terminate something about like the buyer can still get out. Because if you say it's for informational purposes only, and then you don't check that optional paragraph, like you've given your buyer no way out. So you have to write something about they still have an out. If you're waiving like $2,000, they still have the out because you're going to still negotiate. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, what and about then when, um, yeah. so say you've written a, a contract, you've put in an escalation clause, and then the, the selling agent comes back and says, I need your best and final offer. I mean, do you see that often when you've already put an escalation clause in there? And what do. You, do you, have you changed it or have you just stuck mm -hmm. with, okay. with what I got? It depends. So if the seller calls me back and is like, hey, final, highest and best by this time, my call is then to my client. Like, hey, we put this in, this is what we did. You know, they're asking for highest and best is this our highest and best or are you willing to wiggle a little bit? If they say, no, that's my highest and best. Then I call the seller back and I'm like, Hey, that's our highest and best. Like we can't do anything. If there's some wiggle room, then I'll start, you know, changing some things and resending it back. It just depends on what my clients say. Cause that's who I ultimately work for. You know, Easy. and I, I always tell them I don't pay their payment. So whatever they're comfortable with is what I'm going to go with. I don't give my clients, um, they always ask me like, what would you pay? And I'm like, well, guys, ultimately I'm not going to live there and I'm not going to pay your payment. So it's what you're comfortable with. Like, so I will stop you, you if you're going, go ahead. What would you adjust then? I mean, would you adjust what you're willing to go up to? Like what, what, I, what would you adjust? So I have done adjusting a price that goes higher. We have started higher. We have jumped straight into, okay, we'll get rid of the escalation clause altogether and we'll just give you you know, the very top of it. So we don't even mess with that. Uh, we have adjusted some things in home inspection. We have called on uh, the, I've called my lender and been like, hey, is there anything you can do to like, when can we close? We put it further out. Can we pull it in? Like, I mean, anything that I can mess with and play with that we didn't do it in the front and they're comfortable with and they suggest, then I'm going to go with. So do area? you, if, yeah, if you have somebody, if the selling agent comes or the listing agent comes back to you and says, Hey, best and final, do you at that point as the buyer's agent have to go in and redo the contract or do you like, how does that process work and like resubmit it? I usually um, redo the contract just to have it nice and clean um, okay. and then send it back to the selling agent. It's just, I don't want a like, I don't want an email going over and then my clients haven't signed it. And then there's this gray area of like, did her clients right. actually say that? I've already written the contract up. It's super easy for me to go in transaction desk, make a couple changes and have them sign it. I was just going to ask because like, obviously with things being as competitive and fast moving as they are right now, have you mm -hmm. ever gotten yourself into a situation where you did have to rewrite something? And obviously you've got to send it back to your clients to have them sign before you can send it over. Like, have you ever lost because they weren't fast enough getting it signed back to you or anything? No, like because that? there's a ton of communication of like, we have to have our offering at this point. And okay. if they stay like on the listing for me, if they say, oh, we're reviewing at five o'clock Sunday, mm -hmm. I'm telling my clients three o'clock gotcha. because I need time to get the offer written. I need time for them to sign it. I need time. Like I need time to get through it all, especially if it's the first time I've ever written an offer for a client. Cause I need time to go through that whole offer mm -hmm. and to walk through it all. So I'm giving them a backed up time knowing that even if we don't get it done by three, like I'll have it done by four and it'll be in. And I've also called the agent where, you know, we saw it at four because that's the only time I could see it. And I'm telling my clients, like, we're literally going to write this, I've literally written offers in the back of my car, like clients and everybody standing there at the back of my car, I'm writing in the offer. And then I have them sign because you can have them do an in-person signing. So you can sign on, like, if you have an iPad or if you have a computer, like they don't even have to go into their email. They can hit the button on your device and have it all signed. Ever done that? 
No, is that, would you just choose a different option, like where it says sign or initial? Is that, what is the, the option for them doing an in-person say? I think it says in-person signing. I'm okay. looking at my computer. But right it's now. all, it's all under like the markup section. Yeah. So instead okay. of, um, I think it's instead of like simul sign, it's, um, I think instead of simul sign, it's something like in-person signing. Okay. I'm pulling it up, see if I can, or I can find it for you. Yeah, so it says when you choose your participants, it says in-person signer or remote signer, you would select in-person signer, okay. and then you put in a, a four-digit code that you would know, and it sends you all the emails. You open it you put in, um, like they put in all their information, they touch all the buttons, and then you put in a code to say you saw them sign it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It works real well if you're up under the gun. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I try to basically give them, give myself lead time. So I'm not up against that. The other thing I've done is I've actually called the agent and been like, hey, you know, they decided to change. They have it in their inbox. I've already talked to them. They're opening it right now. Like I will have it to you in two seconds. And I've had an agent wait a couple, you know, 15, 20 minutes while I get it all signed to get it over to them. It's all about communication. The more you can communicate with that selling agent, A, the more rapport you build and B, you know, you're going to be able to get through what you need. I have missed stuff because my buyers have slept on it and I told them not to, but hey, you know, like I work for them. So that's, if they need to sleep on it, they need to sleep on it. So, but yeah, those are the things that you can mess with. The last thing you can sort of mess with, but not really is a lot is talking to your lender about what your close date is. So when I have a seller or a buyer who's looking to buy a house, I'm calling the seller. I'm talking to my lender and I'm talking to my buyer and I'm talking to my lender going, okay, where are we? Are we in a place where I can write a 30 day contract or are we working with a 1099 like us real estate agents that it's gonna be 45 days all day long? Are we in a place where there's, you've got so many you know, things going on that I have to write 45 days? Like where can I write this contract? Because if my lender's telling me, oh, you can write it for 30 days, I will write it for 30 days all day long. If my lender's like, there is no way I can close this in 30 days, I will not write it for 30 days. I'll write it for 45. Because ultimately, I don't want to get to the end and then have to call this listing agent and tell them, hey, we're pushed back. Um, because, you know, yes, yeah, some of this is out of my control. But if it's in my control to write this contract when my lender tells me to write it, then I'm going to be the truthful one on the front end. And I can honestly say I've never lost a bid due to my closing date. So, but that is a big piece is to be in touch with your lender so that you can write your contract well and write your contract so you don't have missed close dates. Do you find yeah. that anything more than a 30 day ask is frowned upon? Mm -mm. Um, my personal house that I'm buying, I wrote back in December and I close in March. Uh, my lender's buying a, a house. We wrote it in December, she's closing in March. So, and most people, once you get to like the spring and you get to May, June, July, or April, May, June, anyways, like there's so many people going under contract, like 30 days isn't going to happen. Uh, so you're going to be writing those for 45. And when you get into uh, December or, or um, November and December, like with all of those holidays, you're writing those for 45 days because people are closed for Christmas, for Thanksgiving for Black Friday, all of those pieces. So uh, sometimes it's just time of year and sometimes it's volume. But be in contact with your lender and say, hey, where, what are we doing? Um, and know the answer. So if the agent comes back to you and she, they're like, hey, why are you 45 days? You know, you're tit for tat on everything except for closing date. And if you're like, well, hey, my guy is super approved. I'd love for you to talk to the lender, all of that. However, we know it's gonna take a little longer because of X then the agent's like, oh, okay. Or, you know, mm, that's not gonna work for us. We're gonna go with somebody else. So like, I can tell you when I wrote my personal one, it was, hey guys, like 
this is out in March because this is my second full year in real estate. I have to put my taxes in. Like I can't close before March because I need time to put my taxes in, get my taxes back, get all of that to the bank and then have them go through underwriting with me. And the agent called me and she was like, thank you so much for letting me know. Most people just put a long close date and then never give me the reason why. She goes, and that makes it easier for me to be able to talk to my sellers and say, this is why the long close date. And they're more receptive to it. So you can also negotiate like with the refrigerator, washer and dryer, if there's one in there. Um, you can, most of the time I ask for it for $0 for my buyers. But if you wanna make yourself look a little better, you can always say, hey, we'll give you some money for these appliances. And that's another place that you can play with and see if that helps. I mean, if you think about it, like if you go buy a new refrigerator, washer and dryer, you're probably looking at, Fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars, so you could play some there. Are there any questions you have, or anything that's confusing of what I just said? Okay. After you get under contract, so after they say yes, you're accepted. Y'all have done negotiations. Uh, your next big negotiation is going to be that home inspection. And to negotiate there, it starts with you prepping your client well. So your, what I would do to help you prep your client well with that is it starts back at when you show the house. Because when you show the house, what you're looking for is you're looking for what's going to come up on a home inspection. If you're brand new and you're like, well, what the heck would come up on a home inspection? If you're on a team, ask your teammates to see some of their home inspections. If you're not on a team, find somebody that's got some home inspections and say, hey, can I look at them? That way you can start seeing the different pieces and parts that'll come up on a home inspection. And it also a lot of times depends on the age of the house. So like the houses I sell in Church Hill are going to have a totally different set of things that come up on them all the time than say the houses out in Mechanicsville or Glen Allen or things like that. So when you start, when you look at a house, that's what you're looking for. I always tell my buyers, I'm like, hey guys, like when we go look at this house, you're gonna look at, ooh, it's pretty, it's painted well, my furniture fits here, like this fits here, that fits there. I was like, and you're gonna think I'm gonna be picking apart the house because I'm gonna be pointing out every crack, every you know issue, anything that I see that might come up on a home inspection, I'm gonna be pointing it out. I was like, and it's not because I hate the house, it's so that you know what you're getting into. If you yeah. are comfortable with everything I'm pointing out, we'll that's move that's forward. Great. If you are not comfortable, go. yeah. we're going we're gonna to run for the That's not real good. And that's how that's going to go. And they're like, oh, okay. So now they understand like why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it helps me write a good um, offer because now I know, okay, do I see some major things that could come up on the home inspection that I don't want to write that? for informational purposes only, or do I see some things that I could write that or I could do some waivers? Like, because if I have a flipped house and I see some major issues, there's no way I'm touching anything on that home inspection because I'm gonna need that to negotiate with. Does that make sense? And so the other thing I'm prepping, so we get through that and they're like, yeah, everything you see, like we're good to go, let's write this offer. We get the offer, we get to home inspection. And the home inspection, I'm starting right at the beginning with, hey, guys, we're going to get a huge list. Like, we're going to put it into three buckets. I really like three buckets because it gets them thinking. My buckets are like, what do you absolutely want to have done or want money for? What do you want to have done but doesn't necessarily? I'm like, basically the stuff we can negotiate with. I said, and then what doesn't need to be done at all? Like, what can you live with? And so those are the buckets I'm looking for them to put stuff in so that then I can help them negotiate well. So I can be like, okay, yes, roof issues. Okay, do we want to get some money and you do the roof right after you move in? Do we want to get um, an escrow set up so that all the money goes to the escrow? Or do we want to ask them to redo the roof? You know? Um, and those are the types because that's a absolutely positively has to be done. I'm not going to let you move into a house with a crazy roof. It just, it's not going to happen. Um, but you know, Hey, the door doesn't latch all the way. You know, the door sticks on one corner. 
like, hey guys, it's, it's a really easy fix. It's summertime, it's probably swollen. Once it's wintertime, it'll, you know, it'll shrink down, paint the top and bottom, you'll probably be fine. Either that or it's a bent this or, you know, I can, I know what the possible causes are so I can explain it to them. But then we can put this all together and go, okay, are we asking for money? Or are we asking for fixes? And we can negotiate well with, okay, here's all of our asks. Now, when they come back and the seller says, well, you know, you asked for too much money, we only want to give you this, we can go back into those three buckets. And I'm like, okay, guys, well, they're giving you enough money to cover all the things you absolutely want done. Are you okay with this? Like, if you're not, let's, you know, go back to them and start this negotiation back and forth. Or I can be like, hey, guys, they're actually giving you more money than we thought we were going to get because we asked for more than I thought we were going to get <laughs> to start negotiations high. And they'll be like, oh, sweet, okay. And they'll sign it and life is grand. Um, but you want to be able to think about those three different things because you don't want to literally copy and paste your inspection and send it off. If you copy and paste your inspection, you've lost all negotiation power. Your seller is now going to start crossing off all the things that they don't want to do instead of you sending them the things that your buyer wants to do. So to negotiate well, you have to start the negotiations off on the right foot and not let the seller dictate them. Does that make sense? Any yes. questions? Okay. And then what do you do if an appraisal comes back short? Hmm. <laughs> Gary, what do you do? <laughs> Try to renegotiate. Try to... I I guess it would depend on how short it is. How do you start this negotiation, Gary? <laughs> well, um, like I said, I guess it would, it would depend on how short the appraisal is and what the uh, what the buyer is willing to, willing to do. So for me, I don't care how short the negotiation is. When the appraisal comes back short, I will write up an addendum that says the seller and buyer agree that the new price of the house is, and I write in the appraised value, whether it's 2000 short or whether it's 30000 short. And then I just have my seller or my buyer sign it, and I send it over with the appraisal to the seller. And the reason I just say, here it is, is because I cannot tell you how many times we have had the seller just sign it. The seller does not come back and ask for us to negotiate, does not come back and ask for us to do, um, to bring any money to the table. The seller just signs it. Hmm. So again, I start with where I want to start negotiations and then I let the seller come back. Because if I start with, you know, it's appraisal's 10,000 short, my buyer is willing to bring 5,000 to the table. I've put all my cards on the table. I've showed my whole hand and now it's the seller's turn to basically do whatever they want with those cards. If I hold my cards close to my chest and I start with, here's what we want, you know, best solution ever, then maybe the seller signs it. Maybe I have to play another card. Anybody play poker? <laughs> what, what do you do? You hold your cards close to your chest or you show your whole hand before you finish? Hold your cards close to your chest. Exactly, Brian. <laughs> so that's what you're going to do in negotiations is you always hold your cards close to your chest and only play the cards that you need. That's part of the reason I do that escalation clause is because I would rather, yes, it shows where they're willing to go, but it only puts part of my card down. It doesn't like bring them straight to the top. So... And then with an appraisal, like if they don't sign it and they come back and say, hey, you know, if you bring X, we'll bring X, then it's a negotiation back and forth of what's your seller, what's your buyer willing to do and what's the seller willing to do. And, you know, going back and forth to, again, get the best price for your buyer. And, and how about if you're in a, a multiple bid situation, though, on that? Do you take a risk of losing it? So at the point of appraisal, you're the only one under contract. Um, and it's hard for the seller to get out at that point. Okay. You're the one that's basically holding all the cards at that point. Okay. And so 
you know, you're going to negotiate with them. And by that time, you're usually to about a week, week and a half, maybe a half a week before closing. And most sellers aren't going to want to go all the way back to the beginning and start over again. Does that make sense? Yep. Perfect sense. Thank you. You're welcome. So any other questions? I still have my question from earlier, but I don't know when you're done with all of your stuff. So I'm just waiting until the end. <laughs> Go ahead, Ariel. What you got? Okay. So this is kind of just coming as a follow-up because we had our meeting yesterday and you've done so well with your business, like 350% growth in your first year, which is tremendous. Um, as in, uh, congratulations. Um, as, a, as a newer agent who for, and I don't want to speak for anybody else on this call, but for me, I've tried a lot of different avenues in terms of like getting leads and how I approach people. And I was just really wondering if you could share some insight about like what's worked really well for you as far as getting leads 